Have you ever heard the expression that believer is carnal or that church is carnal? This phrase is used to describe Christian people who follow their sinful desires and are far from leading a spiritual life. Questions will arise such as, how can I know if I am a carnal believer? Is it possible that I believe I am spiritual but I am actually carnal? How can I get out of this situation? How can I discern between the spiritual and the carnal? What are the consequences if I continue like this? Will I be saved? Greetings, dear listeners. In this video, we present seven signs that reveal that a believer is walking according to the flesh. By analyzing this video, you will be able to question yourself what your spiritual condition is, or if you are in a group of believers who are also walking according to the flesh. Furthermore, at the end, we will give you some guidelines so that you can improve your spiritual life. This video promises to be fascinating and edifying. We are sure that through the Word of God, you will begin to see the Christian life differently. Before you continue, make sure to like this video and subscribe to this channel. It is important to mention that here you will only find Christian content, such as biblical prophecies, teachings, stories, and characters from the Bible. Let's start. When we talk about the carnal nature, also known as the old nature or sinful nature, we are referring to the constant tendency towards sin and rebellion against God. The believer who has experienced a new birth carries within him opposite desires and impulses. The ancient instincts of the Adamic nature still persist without being eradicated. These constantly divert us from the will of God and lead us to commit sins. Now, many believers face difficulties in their spiritual life despite having accepted the gospel as a new way of living. In the Christian life, some problems such as current sins and transgressions are resolved through the new birth. Other problems, such as carnal affections and attitudes, are resolved through the purifying power of the Holy Spirit in the process of entire sanctification. Furthermore, there are other problems that are not related to sin or the carnal mind, and they are resolved through spiritual maturity, growth in grace, and broadening of understanding. Lack of seriousness in the need to mortify the old man is a common problem among many believers. It is important that we pay attention to what is mentioned in Ephesians, specifically in chapter 4, verses 22 to 24. As for your former way of life, put off the old man, which is corrupted according to deceitful desires, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and put on the new man, created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. If this is not obeyed, we can affirm that a problem will arise in that believing individual, since he will adopt an earthly mentality and exhibit behaviors in accordance with the patterns of his carnal thought. Consequently, he will demonstrate behavior contrary to Christian principles, selfish and motivated by worldly desires, thus distancing himself from the life of walking in the Spirit. Dear listener, are you completely dedicated to sanctification? Has he really put off the old man? What spiritual level do you think he is at? Now next, let's examine the seven tests that prove someone is a believer who lives according to carnal desires. Number one, spiritual infantilism. These believers act as newly converted, that is, children in Christ. At the beginning of the Christian life, believers are carnal due to the harmful persistence of the natural state. However, the Christian life is not static. One can develop as a mature Christian by eliminating carnal tendencies, or one will inevitably regress to a state of deliberate infantilism. This carnal believer, despite having been a Christian for several years, continues to act like a recent convert. He sees the things of the Lord like a child and does not know how to face the Christian life. Their infantilism is manifested by their unconsciousness and worldly tendencies immaturity, and lack of serious commitment in the congregation. We can say that his spiritual immaturity is shown in many ways, both in his spiritual life and in his relationship with other believers and with the world. Let's read the first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 3, verse 1. Therefore, brothers, I could not speak to you as to spiritual people, but as to carnal people, as to children in Christ. Paul could not treat the Corinthian believers as if they were being led by the Holy Spirit, since despite being converted, 
they were still earthly-minded. This means that they continued to think and act according to worldly values and did not have the ability to correctly discern all things as someone who is truly spiritual would. These Christians of the Corinthian church were still children. They were still weak in grace, though eminent in gifts. In the church of Corinth, all spiritual gifts were manifested, from science to miracles. Nevertheless, they were carnal. Sometimes it is believed that a church where the gifts are manifested is a spiritual church. This is not always the case. It is clear that the gift does not define the Christian, but rather his character, his maturity, or in a single word, the fruit of the Spirit. Number two, the focus of your thinking. The believer who lives according to the flesh worries, thinks, and dedicates his time and attention to earthly things, leaving God aside. The carnal believer is like a child who only seeks to have fun and gets upset when asked to study. He cries, but jumps for joy when we talk about games. Likewise, in the spiritual realm, your priority is not the things of God. He complains when it comes to spiritual matters such as prayer, fasting, vigil, evangelizing, or Bible study. He feels uncomfortable because his mind is not focused on it, and he shows apathy. However, when something like a birthday or work, money, or other things is mentioned, he finds time to indulge, but not for spiritual things. Let's read verse 5 of chapter 8 of the letter to the Romans. For those who are of the flesh, think about the things of the flesh, but those who are of the Spirit, in the things of the Spirit. The Greek word for think is phronio, meaning to think about, to be concerned with, to set one's mind on, to strive for. The verb denotes the complete action of the affections and will, as well as reason. All the mental and moral activity of those who are of the flesh is focused on the selfish indulgence of carnal desires. The life that is dominated by sinful human nature, whose center is the self, whose only law is its own desire which seizes what it wants as much as it can. Different people will describe that life differently. It can be controlled by passions, lust, pride, or ambition. It is characterized by being absorbed in the things in which human nature delights without Christ. I knew an older man who was a believer, but he never participated in fasting, Bible studies, or any spiritual activities. He always found excuses related to his health. However, his true passion was fishing. He walked for four hours from his house to the beach and spent the entire day fishing, regardless of his hunger. Can I ask you, my listening friend, what is your mind focused on? Number three, a carnal behavior. The sinful attitude is the result of carnality. Let's read chapter three, verses three and five of the first letter to the Corinthians. Because you are still carnal, for since there is jealousy, strife, and dissension among you, are you not carnal and walk like men? Because saying the one, I certainly am of Paul, and the other, I am from Apollos, are you not carnal? What then is Paul, and what is Apollos? Servants through whom you have believed, and that according to what the Lord granted to each one. Paul begins to describe more precisely the nature of the Corinthians' carnal immaturity. The first thing that his carnality implies is his contentious spirit and his divisions. This clearly indicates that they are being governed by their own selfishness and not by the Spirit of God. By using the word yet, the Apostle shows his desire that the Corinthians had progressed in their maturity. The signs of immaturity in his case are jealousy and strife. Both things are mentioned by Paul in Galatians chapter 5 verse 20 as works of the flesh. Paul mentions the characteristics of the carnal Christian. Although this list does not include all the manifestations of this state, it allows you to address one of the main problems in Corinth. The divisions, jealousy, also known as envy, is the feeling that leads a person to put down another person to elevate themselves. They refuse to recognize the talents of others, but take pride in those same qualities when they are their own. He also says it is contentious, caused by jealousy and envy, they are the result of discord and hatred that takes over a person. These unhealthy and anti-Christian rivalries indicate an attitude of competition, argument, and gossip. William Barclay says, 
If you never agree with anyone, if you are always fighting and arguing with others and causing trouble, you may attend church regularly and even hold some position in it, but you are not a man of God. However, if you get along well with others and your relationships are based on love, unity, and harmony, then you are on your way to being a man of God. Another characteristic of the carnal man is inclination to idolize a leader. Jealousy and strife often result in direct, matter-of-fact expression. In this case, a misdirected loyalty to human leadership was displayed. In one saying, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are they not acting in a carnal manner? Elevating human personality to the point of causing divisions is an act of fallen humanity. His divisions were a clear reflection of his worldly mentality, not his spiritual discernment. Dear listener, it is important for you to know that those who have rivalries, disputes, and conflicts, all of which go against love of neighbor, are acting according to their carnal desires. There are believers who follow their leader without questioning. Even when they are wrong, they defend them fervently. Number 4. Their Spiritual Nutrition The word child comes from the Greek napios and is used in this context to refer to someone who is not mature. These believers were not children in Christ in the sense of being new converts, but in the sense of not being mature, of not having grown. The newly converted is like a child in Christ who grows through the milk of the Word of God. However, if he does not grow, he remains immature and his diet is limited to milk. This is not ideal. We must grow until we reach spiritual maturity and consume solid food. Both milk and meat are nutritious foods. However, milk is recommended for children who have a delicate and still developing body, while meat is more suitable for adult and strong people who need energy to do demanding jobs. Let's read the first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 3, verse 2. I gave you milk to drink, and not meat, because you were not yet capable nor are you still capable. Paul did not differentiate between two types of doctrine, one for weak Christians and one for mature Christians. His gospel was the same for everyone. However, different methods are used in preaching and different purposes are pursued. Milk symbolizes the simple declaration of the gospel addressed to sinners, that is, missionary or evangelistic preaching. On the other hand, Food represents the type of preaching that shows the possibilities of grace, that points out the obligations and duties of the Christian life, that presents the wide scope of personal redemption and the universal ministry of the Holy Spirit. At first, Paul treated the Corinthians with kindness, as a nurse treats a child. The reason for this dairy diet was because they were not ready yet. The deficiency was in the people's ability to receive the full message of the gospel not in Paul's inability to present it. The Corinthians had not grown in grace and humility as expected. Instead, they were proud of their gifts and abilities. Instead of showing unity, they were full of discord and disagreement, tolerating even the worst sins in his community. Instead of glorifying Christ, they were fighting among themselves, desecrating the Lord's Supper and denying the resurrection. Paul accuses them directly, telling them that the persistence of the carnal mind is the reason for their actions, for you are still carnal. Dear listeners, on many occasions believers continue to consume milk when they should be knowledgeable about the Word of God and teachers who understand the purposes of God. This believer seeks prophecies and clings to dreams or visions instead of the Word of God. Personally, I believe that God speaks through dreams and prophecy, but my fundamental basis is the Word of God. I once asked a sister in Christ how long she had been a believer. Very proud, she told me that she had been there for 37 years. Then I asked him to explain to me the doctrine of the Trinity according to the Bible. He began to stutter and gave me an answer that went against biblical teachings. It's really unfortunate. Could you tell me what type of food you eat? Number 5. His Way of Speaking a person's carnality or spirituality can also be measured through his words. That believer who is carried away by the flesh is usually surrounded by complaints, murmurings, criticisms, and sinful conversations. Let's read the epistle of James chapter 3 verse 2. 
for we all offend many times. If anyone does not offend in word, this is a perfect man, also capable of restraining the whole body. The scriptures teach us clearly about the destructive power of the tongue. This has the ability to express sinful, incorrect, and inappropriate words. Through human speech, we can reflect the depravity of our sinful nature, as we all sin with our words and offend God. We all fail in this aspect, and no one can perfectly control their tongue. If anyone could achieve it, they would be considered perfect. However, the reality is that no one is immune from sinning with their words, so perfection refers to those who are spiritually mature and are able to control their tongue. Dear listeners, many people get carried away by their carnal instincts and act impulsively. Some can be confrontational, and others simply enjoy talking badly about others behind their backs. When someone complains and uses negative, boastful words, it can be said that they are acting carnally. Number 6. Your Capacity for Discernment Those who are weak and immature in faith lack sensitivity and spiritual discernment as to what is good and what is evil in this life, and what honors God or not. The carnal believer always questions why it is wrong to do certain things if everyone does them. Someone once told me, Pastor, it's okay for me to wear my bikini to the beach. There's nothing wrong. I was surprised, since the carnal believer is guided by his human logic, but spiritual discernment mixes things according to the standards of his sinful heart. Let's read the epistle to the Hebrews chapter 5, verses 13 and 14. And everyone who partakes of the milk is unlearned in the word of righteousness, because he is a child. But solid food is for those who have reached maturity, for those who, through use, have their senses exercised in the discernment of good and evil. The believer who follows the desires of the flesh is guided by his own personal preferences and tastes. On the contrary, believers who have achieved spiritual maturity have trained their senses to distinguish between right and wrong through the constant practice of justice and obedience. They have developed the ability to understand the profound teaching of God's Word and achieve the fullness of Christ by loving justice and rejecting evil. They have renewed their minds according to the principles of righteousness, and the Holy Spirit has enabled them to see things from God's perspective. Number 7. Your Feelings and Emotions Those who live according to the flesh are emotional and sentimental, but they follow the standards of their sinful desires and not of the Spirit. This type of believer is very sensitive. It is difficult for him to forgive and ask for forgiveness. He quickly becomes discouraged and feels bad if he is reproached or wrongly pointed out, which causes him to distance himself from others. He is spiteful and tends to get carried away by outbursts of anger and rage. A few days ago, I called out a sister in Christ for her bad behavior. She started crying and told me, Pastor, I don't want to cause you discomfort. I resign from the position I have so I can be happy. I responded, Sister, if I correct you, it is so that you can improve as a Christian every day. The carnal believer does not understand this, as he generally seeks praise and applause instead of constructive correction. Let's read what Colossians chapter 3 verses 12 and 13 says, Put on, therefore, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, tender mercy, kindness, humility, meekness, patience, bearing with one another, and forgiving one another if anyone has a complaint against another. As Christ forgave you, so do you. Paul describes the Christian graces we must put on. Endearing mercy speaks of a heart of compassion. Benignity speaks of a spirit detached from doing things for others. It is an attitude of affection or goodwill. Humility means the willingness to be put down and to consider others as better than oneself. Meekness does not speak of weakness, but rather of the strength of denying oneself and walking with grace toward all men. A certain author said, The common assumption is that when someone is meek, it is because he cannot defend himself. But the Lord was meek because he had the infinite resources of God at his disposal. Described in negative terms, meekness is the opposite of self-assertion and self-interest. 
It is an equanimity of spirit that neither becomes enthusiastic nor depressed, simply because it does not concern itself at all with its own self. If humility is the absence of pride, then meekness is the absence of passion. Long-suffering speaks of patience under provocation and of enduring offenses for a long time. It combines joy with a kind attitude toward others, along with perseverance in suffering. Dear listener, we have shared with you some signs of a carnal believer that should not be overlooked. The question that arises is, what happens to carnal believers? The state of carnal believers is that in which, although they do not live in sin and rebellion constantly, their behavior does not reflect growth in grace, and they act like recent converts who do not yet fully understand salvation in Christ. These carnal believers are characterized by jealousy, strife, and dissension. Furthermore, they show indifference and tolerance towards immorality within the church. They do not take the word of God or the apostles seriously. They even take trivial matters to court. Importantly, Paul considers those Corinthians who have committed sexual immorality or other scandalous sins to be excluded from salvation in Christ. The carnal believers of Corinth are in danger of straying from their sincere devotion to Christ and becoming more and more adapted to the world. For this reason, the Lord will punish and judge them, and if they continue to adapt to the world, they will be excluded from the kingdom of God. In fact, some of them have already experienced spiritual death due to their great sin. In short, carnal believers are in a dangerous state in which their behavior and attitudes do not reflect spiritual growth, and they risk being excluded from the kingdom of God if they do not repent and change their way of living. Now, warnings for believers who live according to the flesh. First, it is important for carnal believers to understand that they risk falling away from the faith if they are not willing to purify themselves from everything that displeases God. Second, they should reflect on the tragic example of the Israelites who were destroyed by God because of sin. Third, it is essential to understand that you cannot participate in both the things of the Lord and those of Satan at the same time. Fourth, they must completely separate themselves from the world and purify themselves from all pollution of flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. And so we come to the end of this video, and we hope it has been useful to you. See you in the next video. God bless you.